Arriving home from work one day, I pulled into my complex, quickly gathered my mail, and out of the corner of my eye, I could see in bold black letters something written on my garage door, 187 PC. Do you know what 187 P is, PC is? It is the penal code for murder. Now on this day is when things would escalate, and I was scared. I was scared to be alone, scared to come home, scared to pull into my own complex to get my mail. Everywhere I was, they were there. Now I'd spent the last three years fighting for the right to live in a peaceful neighborhood with what started off as one gang member that soon turned to 12. All of it taking place in front of my house, on my porch, my front yard for three long years. Growing up on the south side of Chicago, moving to Pasadena, California, as a young black female, I often found myself fighting for rights, my rights and my equality that I was entitled to. But it was never easy. On this occasion, I gathered some neighbors together who were also sick and tired of the gang activity, and together we worked with the police department, the gang unit, and a, com a community program in order to get these guys out. This took a real toll on my personal and my work life. I had two jobs back then, full-time HR director and part-time travel agent every day after work. Both were difficult to navigate and to concentrate on during this time. But I was resolute. I was not going to let those guys drive me out. I was determined. I was persistent. I was I knew, the end, I knew my end game, and I fought to make the finish line. I knew there were bigger things ahead. So after years of keeping records of diaries, of logs, getting up at 4 a.m. to paint over their graffiti before I went to work, of being called every racial epithet in the book, of being threatened every day, I heard the words of the captain of the gang unit say, Kay, you won. Each of those 12 gang members were ordered by the court to move within 60 days, and hallelujah, they did. <laughs> to quote the words of Maya Angelou, you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Over the next three years, life changed a bit. I bought a new home. I was excited. I was able to relax a little bit. I was going to, look, to move my mom into the home with me when suddenly my mom would pass away, and I was devastated. Not, not long after that, a tragic motor vehicle accident would leave me incapacitated, unresponsive, in, in, unresponsive <laughs> and unconscious and in a fight for my life. My three brothers at the time would take care of me over the course of the next year to help get me on my feet and get me back to work. Once I returned to work, one of those brothers, my youngest brother, would pass away suddenly, and I was inconsolable. Not long after that, my next youngest brother would pass away, and I was beyond paralyzed by grief. The ripple effect had entered my life, disrupted it, and my life was a complete mess. How could this happen? I was broken, and I didn't think I could be fixed. Consumed by grief and depression over the next days, weeks, months that turned to years, I could not find a way to bring myself out of it, and I wasn't sure that I wanted to. My brother and my son were dealing with it in their way. But I was in the why me phase, feeling sorry for myself and pitying myself. I was losing what little strength and power I had left. I felt as if I was on that thin line between falling off a cliff and standing tall and pressing forward. Yet the world was smiling at me and comforting me, but I wasn't smiling back, and I knew I was losing the power to be me. Confronted with the choice of being continually debilitated by grief or empowered by grief, I chose the latter. I had been living for the last number of years, living to die, and now I was dying to live. 
My life had been flipping by me for far too long. And one morning, I awakened. I had made a decision. I decided that I was going to take a trip because I needed something positive to impact my own health and well-being. I found myself on a journey that would change my environment, and I found myself in Tanzania. Now, you may ask, why Tanzania? Because it was the only trip that was immediately available and open. Once I arrived in Tanzania, I was, I was embraced, and I was immersed in the warmth of the Tanzanian people. They surrounded me with love, but they did not know my grief. But I felt like they did. They took my hand, they touched my heart, and they embraced me as if I were one of their own. They taught me to fight, but they taught me to fight to look forward and not backwards. And they taught me to fight to live instead of planning to die. They took me from grief to joy. Now suddenly, when life had been dark for so long, I saw light. I saw, I was in awe. I saw inspiration. I saw beauty. I saw the diversity of people, the multitude of colors of Mother Nature, and I saw life all around me. I extended my trip, immersed myself in their culture, and connected with the people up close and personal. Now, I can't tell you today what really happened on that trip, but something happened to me, and the only thing that I could attribute it to is divine intervention. Because suddenly, grief and depression turned to excitement and exhilaration. And what's more important, I was getting my smile back. I'd worked more, <laughs> I'd worked more than 40 years in a career that I loved. But I wasn't really fulfilled. I'd worked in the travel business almost equally as long. But I was fulfilled by travel. But I thought about my brothers, gone far, so young. And I knew I wanted to live, but I wanted to do something more meaningful with my life for them. And I thought my experience would help create that, that opportunity. As HR director, I knew after these 40 years it was time to retire. Because as an HR director, I had to immerse myself in my employees' um, development and skills and help them in their, in their job. As a travel agent, I had to do much the same thing. I had to, I was leading groups, so I had to understand relationships, how to deal with people, and foster good, pub, good group relationships. So I had no problems on safari. And, um, I thought both of these skills as HR director and travel agent would help me in establishing my own business. Now, I planned to open up a business with a girlfriend who owned her own travel agency. But once again, that ripple effect came into my life when she passed away on the floor of my house as we were working on our plans to start our business together. My first business lesson was the challenge to figure out how to start my own agency. I did not know this part of the travel business. I did not know where to go, what to do, what agencies, accreditations, qualifications, eligibility, how much it cost. I didn't know A, and I had to get to Z. So I persevered, I researched, and I persevered. What I did know was I was going to be this American black female working in Tanzania, creating a niche market, and promoting this unique destination to those who were, not, who were reluctant to travel and those who wanted to travel. Now, age 62, I thought, was I crazy? Well, one year later, Destined to Travel was born a fully accredited travel agency. My next business lesson, nothing is quick and nothing is easy in Africa. So you don't just decide to start your own business and then go to a foreign country. No, nope, it didn't work like that. I thought it did at first, but it didn't. So Destined to Travel worked for two years, 
creating, organizing, planning, and leading groups with other companies before I could actually think about establishing a business of my own the way I envisioned it. But to do that, I needed a couple of things, which I didn't have. I needed a driver, and I needed a vehicle. So how was I going to accomplish that? Over the last two years, the course of those two years, I was familiar with a driver named Paul. He was a local Tanzanian. He had a great reputation as a safari guide, but he was also a wildlife safari expert and naturalist. He had a great personality. He spoke English perfectly. He had a great command of the English language, the understanding of the English language. And he had taken my family on safari many times. And he worked for a company that actually hired the best drivers in Tanzania. And he was a mechanical engineer, which was good. And he was keen to work. He was the ideal kind of driver that I could have ever hoped for. And he was keen to work with a smaller company so that he could make a difference. But I was scared. I was skeptical. I'm in Tanzania. How could I trust somebody? But on the other hand, I knew that in order to succeed, I needed the help and guidance of a local who could help guide me through the process of finishing creating the business that I wanted. So Paul would be that person who would step up and help me navigate through the maze of purchasing a safari vehicle and of understanding how to work in a culture of male dominance, which was a lesson, by the way. And together we agreed that he would drive, house, and maintain the vehicle, because he was a mechanical engineer, and to, we would work together. So, um, so this black female, and the only black female working in Tanzania today, leading her own groups and having her own company, would find herself stepping out on faith and together in this patriarchal society, Paul and I eased into a comfortable working relationship that has now spanned the last 14 years. And, and, and today, we are, I am well respected, I am accepted, and we have more vehicles and drivers, and we are still making a difference and creating memories for our guests that will last a lifetime. And along this healing journey came a children's home, an orphanage of sorts. And I was introduced to them by an article on the front page of the Los Angeles Times and I, and about the founder who was trying to make, uh, to support the 14, the 14 children he had at the time that were living with him, disadvantaged children. I set out to find him, meeting him, was a history lesson right there in Tanzania. He was the former leader of the Kansas City chapter of the Black Panthers. And before you go off and thinking terrorist organization or whatever it is that comes to mind, no, he was not. And this was more than 50 years ago. And his story is history that you will not read about in any book or hear about in any words unless by him or directly from him. I was so impressed with what he did, what he was doing, I wanted my guests to experience it. And they do. But I wanted to do more. I wanted to, uh, my next business lesson was to figure out my why, what and how. Why I wanted to do it, what meaningful difference could it make, and how would it benefit the children. I thought about it for a very long time. But like I said, nothing comes easy and fast in Tanzania. So I thought about a way to bring others together to instill in the children about the challenges they would face in their life. But I wanted to make sure their education was taken care of as well, maybe a nonprofit. This was not about me. This was about creating a program long term that would help and benefit the children of the leaders of tomorrow's children's home and make a difference in their life. I'm very proud to say that one year later, the, make, the first Make a Difference Safari became a reality 
followed by a 501c3, and today we are supporting the education of 28 children in that Leaders of Tomorrow Children's Home through donations and sponsorships by our guests, who say all the time to me they are enlightened by the experience, captivated by the experience, and all find it the highlight of the trip. Now, I'm still learning, but what I have discovered is a life worth living, my life. And there is peace after a painful journey of grief. To quote the late, great Elijah Cummings, take your pain, turn it into your passion, and make that your purpose. I discovered that along my journey, sometimes you have to go away to come back stronger. Sometimes it's the dreams you, dreams you don't have that become your reality. And the plus side for me was a period of self-discovery of during a painful journey of grief that provided me with a passion and created that purpose that I needed. Because without purpose, I would not be destined to travel. And once again, I rise. In the words of Maya Angelou, leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a new life that's wondrously clear. I rise, I rise, I rise. <laughs>